Um, what do you think are the key processes um, in transformation of consciousness? Key processes, what do you mean by that? Like key processes in what terms? In terms of... In because terms of self-realization, perception, refinements, and the whole process of um, dissolution of mind, although we didn't talk about it, we, we already touched about uh, on it a little bit, but that whole process of um, from beginning to the whole uh, constant unfolding, like what are the key elements, uh, do you think, like um, what are the key shifts or realizations that happen along the way? Mm, I see. Um, well, at some point we even uh, have created this kind of just out of um, a healthy exercise, a whole delineation of what the process is really and how the process you know what the kind of full arch of the process but here perhaps i will emphasize on what you even and, and you're asking that to what are the key right what are the key um, phases or aspects i would say First, as a prerequisite, perhaps, is a certain existential predisposition. So instead of going straight to what is actually uh, self-realization, but there has to be a kind of a predisposition, that existential situation. It is exemplified by certain realignment of creative forces or speaking more in that um, in in relation to this um, energetic bodily processes is this pranic realignment so this kind of reaching existential station or existential condition where one has to know the truth you see, it's again uh, that famous canonical encounter of Arjuna with Krishna, right? It begins with that despondency in the chapter 1 of the Bhagavad Gita where great hero of his time realizes he cannot act. So this, what I call existential predisposition arises out of that condition where one need to know the truth. So, given that there is this sincere desire to know because one is inseparable from the other, that tapas, that burning flame is number one because without it Everything will be placid. Without it coming, going, it's like... In fact, we could say that nothing can be achieved in life in any sphere, in any area, without that. One needs to want to have that. So therefore, this existential condition, this predisposition, which comes from anything, it could come from being enough with what one went through. Or not enough with having enough, encountering some experiences which bring no answers and maybe need reconciliation and reconciliation doesn't come. Again, that creates that predicament and this is a healthy predicament in terms of spiritual earn in that, in that you know, I would not even hesitate to say that it causes that existential state of agony. 
that where that predisposition is, I have to know the truth. Like Rumi exclaimed, you know, I need to know, I need to see the face of God. Show me your face, you know. Demanding almost. Not almost, demanding it. Then the second is, second phase or second most important crucial is that consistency, consistency in terms of what one really stands for in, one, in all one's being. One needs to have the integrity to follow it through. In other words, that burning desire is not enough. It will need to have this, it needs to be propped by that consistency of effort. That consistency of effort can be exemplified in so many ways. I don't want to go enumerating it, but just that. How it will manifest itself. Maybe for someone it's initiation into a specific practice, specific practice of meditation. Certain maybe um, ritual, maybe some certain way, you know, it doesn't matter. It could be so many different ways of how it can express itself. Then comes this first encounter with truth. I would say that this is a very important phase where disillusionment is being seen. Disillusionment. And it can happen again. It can be either all of a sudden where things just crumble down and the naked truth is just staring at us in the face. This can be accompanied by collapse of this structure that we have formed and maintained. All that propped by rational way of thinking and that sort of completely um, sustained by culture as well. And our participation daily, willingly, unwillingly, consciously or not. So that encounter with truth can be because it's an act of grace. It can be because we stumbled on that. It doesn't matter. And out of that comes this, what then more traditionally spoken in terms of awakening. And awakening here, of course, it's a, not just a lightly spoken term. It's the entire shift in one's perception. So in other words, if one considered oneself to be so-and-so, and living being, and this and that, and even though intellectually one understood that this is not so, one actually experiences that. One in, is in the presence, viscerally, of that shift, and that shift presents itself uh, to whatever degree the uh, utter state of affairs. So this is a very important state. I would say very important phase because from there on the degree and the intent of the intensity is paramount to the all that goes into this dedication because people can also like Osho said when they come to the edge of the cliff they look down into the abyss and they run back into the forest of samsara they all talk about, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out, I'm fed up with this. I want to be out of this, I want to know. But when it requires that final jump, leap, then suddenly, no, I want to be back, I want to be, you know. Yeah, it's understandable. For, you know, it can be quite, not just disorienting and you know, disheartening, it can be overwhelming. So it's an important phase then simply begins the dismantling, because it cannot be dismantled in one go. Dismantling of those vikalpas, dismantling of that sans samskaric field. And this is where a lot of work, a lot of work, this is where the dedication, and this is where sadhana really begins, again speaking from more traditional understanding, Real sadhana is self-initiatory. Before that, we apply effort. Before that, we build up. 
we kind of under that existential pressure. But with awakening, often it grants us with that spontaneous, involuntary propensity. Because it's, you know, we are in the process of when everything is being unwinded. And in that unwinding, a lot of stuff comes to the surface. And it's not pleasant. This is where we need to face. And this is borrowing that more of a kind of psychology-based language where we begin to face all the demons that begin to come out of our cupboards. All this, all this, what has been nicely covered beneath comes to the surface. And it's a phase of dismantling. So I would say this is an important phase. Then there is an important phase again of the phase of repose and integration. So that we allowed allow to enjoy this, really enjoy this, because in the dismantling phase it's very difficult to enjoy. We might be thrown into the uh, involuntary states of this or that beatitude or bliss, but there's a lot of laundry as well. So it's not given that the ride is smooth. The ride is more often rough. And in the repose, in that integration phase, there is this possibility to finally savor this. And it's an important phase. And that phase is also very important to begin to rebuild connections with the world consciously. We are not allowed, we can't afford to act from this previous set of unconscious responses or subconscious responses. This is where that razor edge walk begins. And maybe just to kind of give it a, um, as a, yet again, very important is the phase of embodiment. Embodiment or return, repossession, you know, embodiment is where even at the level of neurophysiology, our faculties get refined because this is all-encompassing. So it's not just something happened to consciousness and we are then dealt with the body. That gap would need to be bridged and the embodiment is that process. Not, we, not that we ever disembodied, we always embodied. But here the process of embodiment is that process of return. where, allegorically speaking, the body is purified now, purified. And so consciousness can dwell there in a different way. Not that it will only be roses from now on, but that embodiment also requires a lot of dedication on our part because very few people can completely um, the process is so intense that all the sankalpic, uh, not sankalpic, vikalpa, you know, all these psychic impressions are destroyed. Because if that happens, it also could be undesirable. You know, that there, there is these safety mechanisms at work as well, where the unplugging, that unplugging. Um, speaking the language of neuroscience, when synaptic connections are weakened and completely dissociated and completely unplugged, if it happens to a degree, it's a healthy and good and we can go through it. If the unplugging is uh, radical and complete, we will be lost in prolonged phases of complete not knowing 
what the heck is going on and who we are. And that's not desirable. So therefore, gradual unplugging of synaptic connections is more preferable. So therefore, I'm saying very few people, maybe of the status of those like Ramana Maharshi could afford that, and it happened to him at such a young age, even that was a, took a toll on his body. We know that. So after that, um, certain samskaric impressions, certain psychic impressions will still be there. And vigilance is needed so that they're not taking over, because they can take over gradually. And I've seen that. I've seen that very often, how very beautiful um, awakenings and how very beautiful process will somehow, when it reaches that phase of repose and return, will be jeopardized and compromised by giving in to these tendencies which have not outlived, did not die out, you see. Somehow something remained there. Maybe it looked like a husk, but it, some tentacles, some connections still remained. And in the process of embodiment, if the new qualitative connections were not created, then the old tendencies can be revived and reassert themselves. 